Good morning. Uh, thank you for coming to the class. Uh, this is our class at 9.30 a.m. and we will carry on the series with uh, numbers. Uh, today I'm going to cover numbers uh, 17 to 20, but mostly I will cover uh, 20 because uh, some of the themes that are recurring in chapter 18 and 19 is about sanitation, and I think uh, we have covered a lot on those. So I'll just uh, pass those, but I'll concentrate on 17 and 20. Uh, the title of this lesson is called Water from the Rock. And let's begin with a prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for yet another time to come to worship you and to break the bread of life. Lord, we have a physical life that needs to be fed because our biological body needs to get going. But truly, we have a spiritual being inside of us who equally need to be fed each day so that we can draw strength, so that our hope of eternity is clear and our salvation is fully assured in our hearts, in our souls, and in our mind. This morning, as we learn the lesson, Water from a Rock, from Moses' life, at this point in time, as he led the people out of Egypt into the land of Canaan, there's much to learn for us. So Lord, may we have an open heart, a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, and most of all, the attitude to obey and to believe and to trust and to walk in Christ-likeness. Be with me, Lord, as we share this message. Pray that your message will touch many souls and many hearts, whether they're listening here live or online, and that they will listen to your call and experience your love, your grace, and your providence. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's begin. Uh, this little chart actually shows where we roughly are at. And today, unfortunately, uh, don't mean to sound positive, once again, the Israelites will have this problem of complaining. And perhaps uh, this is very much part of human nature. And let's not point a finger at them. And this morning, as we learn of it, let's reflect upon ourselves and the impact of complaining. They are now at this moment at uh, Kadesh Barnea. Okay, you will see here. And they are actually on the verge of getting into the land of Canaan. But it's already 38 years. Uh. Just imagine, 38 years out of the children out of Egypt, Egyptian slavery. So that's where we are. And most of the older generations have died, leaving behind the new generation. And this is where we are. So if you see the map here, uh, you will see Kadesh Barnea here. Uh, those who are here, you can see it uh, pointing, but those online, you can't see. And you'll see the blue arrow pointing up to the land of Canaan. Actually, they're just on the verge of it. Okay? And that's where they are. And this is where uh, the lesson unfolds. So uh, if you remember, Brother Casey taught last week uh, there was a rebellion by Korath and 250 uh, of the people who supported him. And they were uh, creating a lot of problems for Moses and Aaron. And uh, God was uh, unhappy and God uh, sent a plague. And uh, there were 14,600 men who died from this incident. So in chapter 17, uh, God is trying to remind the Israelites and to establish his authority. And in Numbers 17, verse 5, it reads, Bards will sprout on the staff belonging to the man I choose. Okay, later I'll elaborate what this staff about. Then I'll finally put an end to the people's murmuring and complaining against you, Moses. Okay? So Moses have a hard time, actually. Uh, sometimes we think leaders are prestigious, powerful, right? Honorable role. But Moses really have a very hard time. So the Lord told Moses to get the chief of the 12 tribes. And each tribe's chief will have a staff. That's how they, the staff represent symbol of power and authority. Yeah? And each staff will have the man, the chief, uh, the man of the tribe written on the staff. 
And what is the purpose? You read in verse 5 of chapter 17, Numbers. The staff that God chose will sprout. That means chose to be leader of the 12 tribes. So Aaron's staff sprouted forth buds, produced blossoms, and bore even ripe almonds. So uh, if we think in our human mind, right, have you seen, uh, have you do some planting before? You do a cutting, and you cut it and put it in a pot. By nature's law, it's impossible for it to sprout, uh, three things, uh, sprout, blossom into a flower, and then fruit. So this is actually a miracle. Perform to keep the Israelites in order, to remind them that God is still their sovereign God, and that any rebellion will not be tolerated, not because Aaron is perfect, it's because Aaron is authorized, empowered by God to be their leader, in this case, together with Moses. So remember that. So Aaron's rod uh, is so symbolic, you know, was later put in front of the tabernacle as a sign for the rebels that they may end, make an end of their grumblings against God, lest they die, which is what happened, right, in the earlier chapter of 16. So what does a rod mean? A rod is a staff, but to us, it means nothing, okay? But maybe if you're in a Boy Scout, you always carry a staff when you go hiking. But that was also to protect us uh, from in case snakes or some animals or in case you sleep from the slope. But the rod is the very same rod when we claim that Jesus is our shepherd. The rod has great significance in the culture and in the minds of the Jews. It represents the authority of God. Okay, so we'll move on from here. Knowing that Aaron's rod butted, blossom, and fruit, which is impossible by all human means. Yeah? And I want you to think, okay, not just of this budding of the rod. How many miracles have God performed since the time they were under the Egyptian slavery to this day? And yet, and yet, the Jews or the Israelites of those days who have seen the power and the glory and the sovereignty of God, will forget and complain and complain. So, we are going to go to chapter 20. It will not be a very long chapter, but I hope to draw a number of lessons from here. It's called Water from the Rock. Just now I show you the map. Now Israel is came, camped at Kadesh. Okay? And it's in 1A means verse 1. 1B means second part of B. Miriam, Moses' sister, died. Okay, later I, I will tell you the significance. I just go through the outline first. And once again, you see, after God performed the last miracle, right, of the Aaron's rod budding, fruiting, they still could not get it. They still complained. How short is the memory of man? They still complain. And what do they complain? I will elaborate to you. So once again, Moses as the leader of God's people, seek God, went to God for help. And God gave him clear instructions, speak to the rock. But unfortunately, yeah, in verse 10 and 11, it's a very tragic part of Moses' life. I pray that all of us, okay, brothers or sisters, as you lead the congregation in whatever aspects of your life, you will not end up like Moses. Because the consequence is that Moses will not enter into land of Canaan because he struck the rock. In our simple mind, uh, it seems unfair, but later I'll tell you why, and I hope you catch a glimpse of the essence why God prevented him from enter, entering the land of Canaan. And God was unhappy. God rebuked Moses. So let's go to our lesson. So in chapter 20, right, we read that Moses' sister, Miriam, died. 
Now, if we do not know the history of the, the Egyptian, it means nothing. Who is Miriam? Miriam was the sister who put Moses in the basket. Remember? Down the river, and Moses was spotted by the princess. And that's how he became the prince of Egypt. He was adopted by the Pharaoh's sister. And so Moses has a very deep gratitude of the one who actually kept him alive because all the firstborn will be killed, including Moses. But he was kept alive by Miriam. So later I'll elaborate more, but I want you to hold this in your mind. That's why uh, what happened to that leads to Moses striking the rock. Huh? Second, what were the people complaining about? The last lesson I taught also about complaining. And remember, God gave manna from heaven. Right? It's so much that they couldn't collect. It takes how many days to walk. But this time, they got manna, but they got no water. Now, it's very easy to point your finger at the, the Israelites. Huh? Just imagine uh, if we are refugees. Which is more important? Both are important, but which is your priority? Water or meat? Water. They have a lot to eat. I can tell you, uh, if you have a lot to eat later, uh, not to disturb your early lunch, and you got no water, right? Even plain water, the restaurant also want to charge you because they know also from this teaching, right? Water is so critical. So they will without water. So they complain to Moses. Okay? And they contended. Contended, uh, it means they confronted Moses and Aaron by saying, back to like the first generation. Remember what they say? It's better for us to be in Egypt because they have this, this, that, that. Later I'll elaborate. Uh. And some even wish to die with the rebellious Korah. You see, the last few years, especially the two and a half since COVID and everything that's happening in the world, if we are honest and we sit quietly in our room, in our apartment, many a times the devil will put depression into our hearts. Because there seems to be no way out. And ours is two years. At this point of time, it's already 38 years had passed. Not counting the time when they were slaves under the Egyptian. So let's not be so proud and so certain that we will not behave like them because we all fall short of the glory of God. If you ask me, I don't know whether I can take it or not to be an Egyptian slave. And now after 38 years, they cannot see the light. Even after so many times, God has performed all the miracles. Okay? That's why some of them say they'd rather die. So let's move on. So what we're going to concentrate, the last time we concentrate on the people's sentiment, their struggles. Today we are going to concentrate on Moses, the leader, the struggle. So some of you will say, oh, I'm not a leader. Not true. Huh? Everybody in this room is a leader. When you speak to someone about God's love, the salvation and the gospel, you are leading somebody to Christ. This is not talking about leaders who are ordained, elders, deacons, ministers. This is talking about the royal priesthood. Each one of us is a leader. So let's look at Moses' stress. Huh? Stress factor number one, Mariam. She died. Mariam was so dear to Moses. And if you read carefully the text, huh? there are three persons who had key roles in the religious sweep of the Exodus. Moses, Aaron and Miriam. And I'm sure Moses was very, very stressed. Okay? Any one of us who have lost loved ones uh, would know that. And it, it is a very painful feeling. And Moses felt that. So this was the number one stress factor. The death of Miriam causes him stress. Factor number two, the difficult living conditions. Although Moses looked very strong, I think, just imagine you are Moses, would you be stressed not? 
actually based on records, uh, there are at least four to five million Israelites no, who need food and water every day. If you read the news about the U Ukrainian situation all over the world, right? There are so many countries supporting, and yet they are struggling to feed the refugees, provide home and welfare. So you think about it. Six million is almost the number of refugees they have, they have gone out of Ukraine. And when I read the news, I saw the news, I thought, how powerful our sovereign God is to be able to provide for six million daily. So the situation was very difficult. So this was an added stress. Now, let's be very honest, okay? Sometimes uh, we are stressed uh, because we order food uh, and the delivery vendor doesn't appear. It's already past one hour. We already make a lot of noise. Right? So you just imagine uh, for 38 years, Moses had to deal with all this complaint and the accountability and the responsibility. So, now it's about water. Okay, let's look at ourselves. Huh? If there is a time where you need a shower after a few days and you turn on the water tap, it doesn't work. Is it easy for you to say, praise the Lord, there's no water? I will honestly say that it's very difficult for myself. If your water break, heater breaks down, huh? we are so luxurious. Then we have to bathe cold water, we're bathing hot, warm water, hot water for a long time. What will you say? Praise the Lord, there is no hot water. So, this is what I meant. This difficult factor huh, is consistent. And I want you to think about it. You know, there are so many stress factors, they are small and minor. But it gnaws, it eats at our faith very deeply, very slowly and it decapacitates us spiritually. So this is what is happening. Food and water is always a struggle. The shelter, they live like a gypsy. The third factor, this is the toughest one huh, for a leader. Moses was with them. Actually, Moses suffered a lot, no? After he killed one of the Egyptian soldiers, what did he do? He had to run for his life, right? Then he had to go into the wilderness and he met his father-in-law, the long story cut short. What did he do? He suffered a lot. And now he's stripped to nothing. From prince to king of the rebel. To come and challenge a pharaoh to take the Egyptian, I take the slaves out of the Egyptian hand. Moses did that. Brought them with the help of God across the Red Sea and so on and so forth. And now for the 38 years, the people don't seem to appreciate how much he has gave for them. And sometimes I look at my own life, it's 50, past 50 years now as a Christian, I felt that way. But after preparing this lesson, I go on my knees and confess to God. I'll tell you why I need to confess to God. And those who are listening, whatever age you are, you also need to confess to God. Because if not, we will end up like Moses. You will not enter the land of Canaan. I'll tell you why eh, at the end. But I confess to God. So these three factors really overwhelm Moses. So what's the result? If you have unresolved frustration in life, you have unresolved anger, you felt that somebody mistreated you, ill-treated you in your family, could be your parents, could be your siblings, could be members of these congregations, brothers and sisters, or fellow colleagues, or fellow workers working in the church. The devil is at your door. We need to resolve this. You know what will happen? Let me show you. At Kadesh, this is the place where the water was to be released by Moses, right? But what happened? When the people grumbled at Moses, this is like called the last straw. Moses went to God, and then God commanded him 
to do three things. Uh, later, I'll tell you what the three things. But in Exodus 17, right, let's reflect. It was the first major complaint and they have no water. So Moses took some elders with him, go back to the rock at Korab and struck the rock with his staff as God has commanded him. And water came out. Okay? Now you may think that the two incidents are similar, but they are not. Huh? Later I'll compare to you. Remember this, huh? he and the elders only. And he was told to struck the rock, he struck the rock, and all the water came out and was able to uh, suffice the thirst of the Israelites. But 38 years later now, the Israelites needed water again, and they doubted God again. So they assembled against Moses and against Aaron. Uh, now, uh, it's not a small thing, you know. It's almost like a rebellion. It's like the whole congregation standing up, asking our leaders or challenging our leaders. They are in contention. They are in big conflict and confrontation. So lesson learned is, if there are un any unhappiness, right, let's do it in a small way, okay? Not in a big way, huh? in a small way, in our private setting, so that it can be resolved. But the problem now is, Moses is impacted by his past. Let me explain to you what he meant in his past, huh? which I'll come to the next slide. They quarreled with Moses and said, listen to this, why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness? Now, this is not the first generation. Huh? This is the second generation, the younger generation. Now, it goes to tell us something, uh, those who are older men and who grew up a lot in the church, bring up our children well. Lead good examples. Why are they complaining? They are following their forefathers. Remember the last lesson, I called them the cry father, cry mother team, right? Kaupe Kabu one. They follow exactly like their pa parents. So their way of addressing pain, struggles, stress, is to complain. And they say, you just look at the word, so similar to what their forefathers or their fathers or their grandfathers said, huh? or their grandparents. Why have you brought the assembly to, of the Lord into this wilderness? It's Moses' fault, huh? that we should die here, both we and the cattle. And why have you made some of us come out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? They are not only scolding Moses, they are scolding God. And brothers and sisters, just pause and be silent. And let God whisper. Did God give you your job, your children, your parents, your home, and each experience. Do we, like the Israelites, dare to shout at God and say, this is the evil place? I hope not. I hope not. They went on to say, it is no place for grain or figs or vines or propagandas, and there's no water to drink. This one, Singaporean, all are, uh, even if you are, you are working here, you are not. This is our culture. When we don't have our food to eat, uh, we get demoralized. Okay? I remember when I and my wife were students at, at Harding. Uh, we miss home so much, but we play a stupid game. Uh. Can you name some of the hawker food that we miss? After we've done that, right, we regret. We regret that. We will never do that again. Because it will kill you, I tell you. It will kill you not physically. You. Mentally, it will kill you. And it will make you more homesick than ever. And if we can understand that, right, in our culture, we can understand what is this complaint all about. But God, in His patience, I want you to note, huh, did not address this directly to the Israelites, no? despite them being so unthankful and ungrateful. He told Moses to do two, three things. Take the rod, remember just uh, the rod is the same as Aaron's rod, uh, represent authority. Gather the people. And I want you to listen to this. Speak to the rock. The first time in Exodus 17 was strike 
the rod. Very important to understand this, huh? so you can know the second part, of the, the, what is the learning point. Okay, now you know this, right? Three things only, very simple. Take the rod, gather the people, speak to the rod. Okay, let's talk about Moses. Huh? At the level of anger, huh? at this point, what would you consider Moses is at? Was he mildly irritated? Those are children, uh, when you irritate your parents, you know, uh, mildly irritated, uh, you can see some frown, some kind of change in the complexion, the color of the skin. Were they indignation, the next level? They don't talk to you, uh, they just walk away. Was there wrath? They show their anger or their fury, they take out your cane and they will punish you. Or was it rage, like road rage? Rage is the point where you will chase after somebody when they horn at you and whatever and you want to kill them. And have you ever thought of it? The person only horn at you three seconds and five seconds and then you want to kill them. And you read a newspaper, right? take out a stirring rod, hit the driver's head and the fellow got concussion and they were charged in court. And some of these people are highly educated people, maybe teachers, engineers, even lawyers themselves or whatever. Why? Why? So let's not laugh at it. This can happen to you or to me. Why? Because unresolved anger, unresolved frustration, right? So what Moses did in his moment of rage, Moses lifted up his hands and with his rock, he smoked the rock not once, twice. That means hit the rock as hard as he can. And water still came out abundantly. And the congregation drank and their beasts, their animals, also, this is where the problem is. Moses was told, speak to the rock. And God will supply water to his people. Pause for a moment and think, why Moses did not follow? Very simple instruction, right? What did he say? Uh, three things. Can you remember? I'm not going to flip the slide. Test. Three things. Huh? Take the rod. Yes, second okay, one. Gather the people and what do? Speak to the rock in front of the people at Kadesh and water will come out, right? At this moment, put ourselves in the shoe of Moses. And if we are Moses, after 38 years and more, plus all the preparation to become a leader, he was totally frustrated, he was angry, he was tired. And the people keep coming back to blame him that he's the one who brought them to this evil place. And this evil place was actually instructed by God, right? So Moses is bearing all the burden, okay? All the accountability. And he just couldn't take it. He loved the people. He sacrificed. He intercedes for them. But they all felt that it was his fault where they are now. Moses actually obeyed God. He still wanted to bring water out of the rock. But listen very carefully. This is scary stuff, okay? In his anger and frustration, he improvised. He innovated. What did he do? The text says, he rebuked them. Listen, you rebels, shall we? We means he and Aaron. Bring water for you out of the rock. Now, you, if you read casually, uh, for years I don't understand this, no? If you read casually, uh, there's nothing wrong. Uh. But at this moment, uh, in the deepest of his heart, right? God was not in Moses' heart. He's asking the people, okay, uh, since you think this evil place that God brought, then I and Moses will do something for you. I and Moses will do something for you, not God without saying that openly. So he innovatively struck the rock twice. I'm sure in anger, huh? although the text didn't say. And water poured out in abundance. But the Lord still provides. This is the part I want you to pause again and let God whisper you. Despite he did not do it God's way, God still loved the people. Water still gushed out. But the text says, but the Lord was extremely displeased 
with Moses and Aaron. My God, if you're a leader, what do you would think? Double whammy. After Moses went through all that, and then I make the mistake out of my frustration, out of anger. I said something. I don't know about you. It has happened to me a number of times. Because I'm a weak man. I love the Lord. But when I was much younger, I have many weaknesses. And this taught me something. Moses took too much on himself and took the glory of God's miracle. All Moses needed to do was to speak and God will manifest the power and the glory of the water coming out of the rock. But he did not do that. He took the glory from God. I know we all love the Lord here, and many of us are in various leadership positions. If ever somebody discourages us, remember this part of the story. When somebody object, even when you tell the truth in love, I've learned, don't take it upon yourself. They are not angry at you. I'm not the one with a salvation plan. The Lord Almighty is the one who has the salvation plan. The Lord is the one who put in the good book what He wants us to do, like a, like a manual of a new product you bought, handphone or whatever, so that you protect us, the human being, from the harm of sin. So don't get discouraged. Shift to God. Go to God and say, God, these people are really complaining against you, Lord. And from a human point of view, I can't take it. Okay? So please take over. And in Psalms 32 verse 8, there's a very encouraging verse that says, I, the Lord, will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. And I will counsel you with my eyes upon you. We always sing a lot of hymns and choruses, but sometimes we don't really meditate on it. And I'm sure if you think of this, this one chorus that we sang, right? About eyes of Jesus upon us. So what do we need to do? The learning is this. Seek to set aside time daily. If you want to be God's leader, you cannot use your strength. You cannot use your talent alone. You cannot use your education. You cannot use your professional career status to say, I'm a great leader for the Lord. Because you look, the prince was made into a shepherd to till the sheep and the cattle before God raised him to spiritual leadership. Meditate. Pray. Ask God for help. And most important, Moses needs to lay his burden down. So this morning, if you have a burden, whatever a burden a brother or sister, a sibling, a parent, or somebody has wronged you, even a teacher or boss, employer, come to the cross and lay your burden down, and let God carry it before we manifest the evil deeds of Satan. Learning. Let God provide. You see the picture here? He actually represents Moses. Huh? Look at how much stress he is. Anxiety, tension, obligation, accountability, responsibility, demands, duty. And not only that, no, if you're a leader, you cannot let go to God, right? Very soon your health will fail. Not only physical health, mental health, spiritual health, soulful health. And you'll find yourself no more energy to serve the Lord. And this is not a joke. This is not set out of anger. This is set out of love. I have gone through it myself. I know. And when God renewed my strength, I told God, with every breath that you give me, I'm going to finish the race. Even if none of them will go with you, I will go. It doesn't matter where. It doesn't matter. If it's only one person, I will go. When I was young, I was prideful. You know what I want to be? I confess. God, I confess before you. 
I wanted to be like those charismatic preachers, preach to 50,000 people at one time. God forgive me. Because now I know it's about honouring God. Moses should have listened to God, but he did it his own way. Well, I like to sing that song, you know? You know that song? I did it my way. No, I don't sing anymore. Because it's bad for the spirit. Don't do it my way. I do it your way. Do it your way. In exhaustion, at times, let's be very honest, we don't pay attention to God. Who do we pay to? Our emotion, our needs, our wants, our frustration. We want to get it done and done fast. Then we fall back on our past wisdom, experience. And that you work the same way. Perhaps, huh? I'm not God. Moses did that. Because the first time, remember? He struck the rock. He struck the rock. But you will say, oh, but it's God's fault. God told you to struck the rock. I said, struck the rock. But second time, what did God say? Speak to the rock. Listen to the word of God carefully and daily. Because in each every moment, the living word of God uh, will whisper a different message from the very same text that you have read even in the last 50 years. Understand? That's why it's called inspired by the Holy Spirit. Not by the digital text or the written text. Okay, move on. Moses could have chosen to ignore the people's provocation when people provoke you and know that when you open the book and you do your devil every day and you know you're right, don't get angry. Pray. Go on your knees and say, Lord, this brother and sister, this friend, this colleague don't understand me. But I bring this at the foot of the cross. And give me strength. So instead of following God's instruction, Moses listened to his past. Okay, let me explain to a past, huh? From a psychological point of view, you understand. Because I teach life skills for a long time, applied psychology, I want to explain this to you. Every time something that happened in the past is called a significant emotional event, especially those negative ones, you will automatically lock into a long-term memory, whether we like it or not, right? So Moses has 38 years plus all the time since he was born, and then he was put in the river, become a prince, and then live a difficult life, and so on and so forth. How many significant emotional events have the Israelites gave to Moses in the last 38 years? Lots of it. So all it takes is for one thing to trigger. I've been a teacher for a long time, you know. Almost 30 something years now. I know some students, the first second they look at me, they don't like me, you know. <laughs> they look like they're enraged, you know, like they're going to punch me. But after I understood this, uh, I realized maybe I look a bit like their father. Maybe my tone of voice when I ask them to behave sounds like their father. And then it triggers all the pain, all the frustration. It could be the father that left him to marry another woman. Yeah. It could be the father that died. I do not know, but these are called significant. So that's what happened to Moses. It triggered Moses. He got frustrated. He overlooked God's instruction. It happens to me many, many times. Every day I struggle with this. When something, uh, even if my wife triggered me, I say, Lord, Lord, help me, give me strength not to lose my cool, not to raise my voice, not to react. This lesson is more for me than any one of you because I'm truly weak. So Moses struck the rock twice. Let me ask you, if you pray to God and you're frustrated, right? Do you need to struck God twice? to make God obey and answer your prayer? Have you ever thought 
Sometimes the way we address God in our private devotion, in our prayer, we are angsty with God. We struck God. Speak gently to God. He already know the answer. Okay, what is the outcome for Moses? The sad outcome. God said to Moses and Aaron, you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people. Verse 12 and 13. Okay, here I want to make a very strong point so you understand. The difference between in Exodus 17 and now is this. Moses was not so angry with the people. He may be irritated. He may be mildly affected, but now he's deeply affected as in rage. He did what God asked him to do. It was easy. No stress. Okay? But now he's under a lot of stress. So what happened? He struck the rock. Why was it so bad? He struck the rock in front of God's people. The whole of the Israelites' nation and make the people think that God has no power, and now Moses and Aaron has the power. You want us to do it? We do it for you. We are struck. What a lesson for us. What a lesson for us. The conclusion is, wherever you are, at whatever stage of life, and especially when you are successful, you enjoy success in any way, in any form, at any age. You are right in front of the people. The people that you are with, your colleagues, your family, you are the head of the house, your children, don't strike the rock. Honour and glorify God. Because we just read a verse, and I'm going to repeat so that you understand, this is the key of the lesson. Numbers 20, sure. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, because you believe me not. And the second part is very important, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this congregation in the land which I have given them. First thing is about faith. Second thing is about destroying the holiness and the sovereignty of God. Third thing is there's a consequence. So, what is the lesson for us? Honoring God in leadership. All of us are Christian leaders. From the bottom of my heart, I tell you, all of us are Christian leaders. Because if we say, oh, the leader up there, oh, Lee Hock is a leader, or oh, Bang John is a leader, or whatever, I join, you will end up, you passive. You remove yourself from the priesthood. In fact, in Numbers, we have no time to cover, right? The next chapter is about God appointing Aaron, 18 uh, and 19, as the Levites, the tribe of East Levites. Even the Levites are not priests, they were supposed to do the work to support the work of the tab tabernacle, repairing the tent, pottery work, whatever work. So back to this. Huh? This is an awesome responsibility. Because if we don't think that we are priests or priestess in our job, even you work in a home and you're a home house helper, and you don't glorify God, how are you going to lead somebody one-on-one? -on -one? in a class, in your own household, or any organized group within PP or church. But most important when you become a leader is this, that Moses and I and you need to be reminded of. We must be careful not to assume our preference and our judgment as God's authority. If we want to worship in this way, it's an approach. Check the good book. And mind you, uh, this is not about legalistic, okay? This is about being close to the whisper of God. Speak to the rock. 
So what went wrong? Probably this is what went wrong. God will probably say to Moses uh, in his heart. You know, sometimes uh, in our heart, our conscience tells us there's some whisper to us. So uh, I'm sure you experienced that before. When you do something wrong, there's a whisper. Probably that's the Holy Spirit prompting you. Uh. The voice probably said to Moses, you doubted me. Speak to the rock. The voice probably said to Moses, you did not rely on me. You struck the rock twice. The voice probably said to Moses, you failed to honour me in front of my people. Brothers and sisters, we always like to use the word my church. And you notice that I don't use the word my church. It is the Lord's church. It's our congregation. It's my congregation. It's my, but it is not our church. Because when we think that it's our church, right? And we couldn't die on the cross like Jesus to redeem others. Maybe that's the reason why some of our Buddhists, our atheist friends, do not want to become Christian because we go to my church. We go to the Lord's church, God's church. And the verse in Numbers 12, 3 is very interesting. You know, nobody has been accorded this title no, except Moses. He was accorded the meekest and the most humble of men on the face of this earth. But yet, yet at this moment, the humblest of men, the meekest of men, is still the not the Lord Jesus Christ, the Saviour. There is only one perfect lamb. There is only one perfect sacrifice. And his name is called Jesus the Christ. And the text proved this. Moses, in his anger, ascribed a miracle to himself instead of glorifying God, and the journey became his and not God's. The journey of the Israelites is about God's hand redeeming his people. It was not about Moses alone as the great leader. We should do everything and all things Friends, brothers and sisters, relatives, whoever are listening to, everything is for God's honour and glory. So, concluding, be a part of God's solution. Always. Not a cause of the problem. I think truly, yeah, complaining with the right attitude is okay. You buy something, right, under warranty, the appliance never work, they have a customer service complaint, then they address. Because it's a real problem. But it's their attitude. If you don't read the text carefully, you will, will misread it again. We do complain, you and I. We can come to God. But let me tell you the secret, okay? Complain to God gently. Father, as I speak to you, I lay down my pain. I'm so frustrated. I'm so angry. I'm so discouraged. Come into my life and touch me. Make me whole. Fill me with your spirit. I think that a kind of complaining is truly acceptable. You will move God to tears because you understood his love. But the people were different. They were part of the problem. They want to destroy the whole organizational structure that God has ordained through Moses and Aaron. There's a reason why they did not enter the promised land. Because they don't know what love is. They only know about self, the pride of life. I want food. I want water. I know only one manner. I want all the hawker food and all the nice food. In conclusion, is this. The rock is symbolic of Christ. i got no time to cover this. Huh? You need to do a lot of reading to get to this conclusion. Jesus is known as the rock. And through this rock, Jesus, gushes forth the water of eternal life. 
for those who have been a Christian for a long time, you will get this metaphor and this theology very quickly. Because God has promised that nothing will stand before us. Just like how badly Israel or the Israelites have failed. But God always kept His promises. Let me ask you, in the end, even when Moses did not enter, he still served the Lord and prepared Joshua as the next leader to bring the people into the land of Canaan. Moses was still the meekest of men in my heart because he did not give up. Even he could not enter. Most of us, when we cannot enter, what we do? We smash out everything like a child. We break all the toys to make sure my brother or sister cannot get it. We crush it. We destroy it. But Moses kept his faith to the end. Because we are heirs to the promise to Abraham and Israel, we shall also firmly believe. Complain gently so that you draw nearer to God. Speak, seek, inquire of Him. And we all will enter the promised land. Let's give prayer and give thanks. And then after we have set a question, you can discuss. Lord, we come to you, first of all, to ask for forgiveness of how ungrateful a people we are, just like the Israelites. If we truly look back our life, Lord, the first time when we encounter you and receive your grace and your love, and decide to commit ourselves to become a disciple, to confess that Jesus is the Son of God, to walk into the watery grave so that we will die with you and to be raised with you again a new life. Lord, we pray that we truly understood, if not in the past, but now, what is it like to be redeemed? For the wonders of all your creation, for every breath, for every step, for every success, for every joy, for every happiness that you gave us. We are so sorry, Lord. We forgot to thank you. Perhaps we are not thankful enough. And we want more and more and more and more. But your son Jesus showed us what is it like to give up everything for us. But Lord, we finish this lesson with great hope to realize that even the heroes of faith who were imperfect will be made perfect because of the cleansing blood of Jesus. And we too, Lord, we ask for the same grace and the same mercy and the same blessing. Lord, in our own wilderness, lead us out into the land of Canaan. The land of spiritual Canaan, where forever the spring of water of life will feed us. But more importantly, Lord, may we desire to drink it every day. Because water, even in our biological life, is indeed life. We want to live. We want to live abundantly, Lord, as you have promised. So bless us as we finish this class. Bless the discussion. Bless our week. Provide for us. Keep us in good health. And help us to stay in the spirit. Okay, so these are the three questions. Huh? You can go into a small groups. We can discuss. Uh, this week, something new. So no, no, no restraint, right? I don't know. I must ask them. Huh? So first question is, are you struggling the same issues you struggled with? I don't know how many years. Uh, two years, ten years, two months, whatever. Identify them and commit to obey and sanctify. Set yourself apart from this sin or this weakness. Are there areas where you're struggling to trust God? Trust is very easy to say, you know, but the moment something happens, even small thing, uh, we get irritated and we, we complain, we already have our trust eroded. Okay? And finally, that's all as you heard in my prayer, always remember to make a list of all the victories God has led you to. You don't believe you just try one day. Your devotion is just to list all the lists. Uh. You'll find that you'll start listing uh, until you feel ashamed. God, why are you so kind to me? Why is God so good to me? I can guarantee you, if you live long enough as Christian, there's lots of good things.
God has given you. So may you bless, be blessed by the discussion. End of class. Thank you.